turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a telephone conversation between a teacher from the art centre and a female student's father about her art courses. First, you have some time to look at questions one to three. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good afternoon. May I speak to Emma's parent? Afternoon. I'm her father. Who am I speaking to? This is Emma's teacher, Jane Carson, calling from the Arts Centre. I'm just calling to talk about her drama class at the centre. Oh, thank you for calling. How's Emma doing in drama class? You know, she just transferred here last month, unlike the others in her class who have been taking the course the whole semester since June. So I'm a bit worried that she might not fit in so well. The father says his daughter Emma has been taking the course since last month, so C has been circled as the answer. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Good afternoon. May I speak to Emma's parent? Afternoon. I'm her father. Who am I speaking to? This is Emma's teacher, Jane Carson, calling from the Arts Centre. I'm just calling to talk about her drama class at the centre. Oh, thank you for calling. How's Emma doing in drama class? You know, she just transferred here last month, unlike the others in her class who have been taking the course the whole semester since June. So I'm a bit worried that she might not fit in so well. There's no need to worry. She exhibits a strong performance in her drama class. Is that so? Yes. She didn't adapt to the new environment as quickly as I originally expected and seemed a bit shy at first, but a few days later she made a couple of friends and became more talkative and also more involved in class. Emma really is a role model for others because she has always been an active participant during class. She voices her own ideas and is very creative. I didn't expect that, but I can tell that she really enjoys the course because she's been talking about it at home frequently these past few weeks. timetable of the drama class next term. Why is that? It's not that the music room that we currently use isn't available, as there are too many enrolling for the coming semester. Increased class size means that space is limited to house the whole class. Also, the new classroom we use is not available during the current time frame, so I'm afraid we have to change the time for it. I see. So when would it be? of the drama class would be a quarter to five. I'm afraid I have errands to run during that time. On the other campus, the class still begins at 3.15, but for the campus Emma goes to, it is the only time available for drama class. Oh, I see. I have to make adjustments to my core schedule then. No problem. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions four to ten. Now listen and answer questions four to ten. Miss Carson, I'm thinking about signing Emma up for another art course. I'm thinking about dance class. Dance class is a popular 
course here. A great choice for a child to shape up and have fun. But unfortunately, it is oversubscribed at the moment. I have to put you on the waiting list. That's too bad. What else can I choose from then? Could you give me some advice? Sure. Emma could take singing class as well. This would improve her musicality. Sounds good. When is that? It is held every Friday evening. That's too bad. Emma already has a swimming class earlier that evening. It will be too late for her to come home if she takes this course. There is also a vocal course available. Emma's got a great voice. I'm sure she'll stand out in the class. Tell me about it. The vocal course starts at 4.30pm every Tuesday. It isn't fully booked yet. Great teacher, experienced and beloved by students. The price is a bit higher, though. How much is it? It's $110. Oh, that's too much. Way over our budget. We have to cover the extra cost if we choose it. Or maybe Emma could take music class. What is it about? Learning about songs and musicals? Well, the students have the opportunity to play different instruments like the piano, drum and so on. They can also learn to write music under professional guidance. That's exactly what Emma is eager to learn. How much would it cost? It was $63 last term, but this term it is $85. $22 more than the original price. We can afford that. When does the course begin? The course starts on September the 7th. Can we start one week later, on September the 14th? My daughter will be on a trip to France with her mum on the 7th. No problem. And the teacher for the class is Jamal Curtis. Just contact him if you have any further questions regarding the course. Jamal Curtis? How do you say Curtis? Oh, it's C-U-R-T-I-S. Thank you. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2 on page 4 of your listening test booklet. Section 2. You will hear a recorded message giving information about an animal park. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the first part of the message and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to the Australian Wildlife Park Information Line. The Australian Wildlife Park is very proudly owned and operated by an Australian family, John and Amanda Brooks, who operate the Australian Wildlife Park with their children, David and Sandra. The family doesn't receive any government assistance. It's solely funded by tourists visiting the park. Thank you for your support and assistance. When the Brooks family purchased the Australian Wildlife Park in 1987, the park housed a small collection of animals and birds on a modest five acre or two hectare property. A few years later, the park doubled in size when the family purchased the adjoining property. Also, the collection of animals started to boom. In May 2003, the family designed and built a new park in the public open space. Once again, more than doubling in size. The park now features about 200 species with more than 2,000 head of animals, birds and reptiles. Regarding the entry fee, adults pay $23, children aged 3 to 14 pay $10, age pensioners are $17 and students are $16. One of the great things about the Australian Wildlife Park is that all of the attractions are included in the entry fee. No extra money is needed around the park, so make the most of your experience. 
All shows, talks, photo opportunities and animal food are included in your entry fee. In addition, the Australian Wildlife Park is open every day of the year, from 9am to 5.30pm, except Christmas Day, 25th of December. Before the final part of the message, you now have 20 seconds to look at questions 16 to 20. Now answer questions 16 to 20. Several attractions are available to visitors to the Australian Wildlife Park. Firstly, you can meet the koalas between 10am and 4.30pm. Here, people can view the koala colony in a natural environment. Another attraction is to feed the kangaroos between 9am and 5.30pm. Visitors can take a walk through the kangaroo enclosure, viewing them in a natural environment. Kangaroo food is provided and the kangaroos are very friendly. Also enjoyable are the wombats. At 11am, 2pm and 3.45pm, there are interactive shows where the team is delighted to introduce you to these popular animals. Other attractions that may interest you are an interactive farmyard, suitable for children of all ages. Animal food is provided and the animals are very friendly. In addition, the working farm is where the country comes to town. Visitors can milk a cow, bottle feed a lamb, watch farm dogs gathering the sheep. All the excitement of a real Australian farm. When they ask for volunteers, be sure to put your hand up. Everyone can get involved. We at the Australian Wildlife Park hope all our visitors have an enjoyable time. See you soon. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student talking to her tutor about a presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Excuse me, Dr Owen, I... Oh, hello, Karen. Have you got a few moments? <laughs> yeah, sure. How can I help you? Well, I've had difficulty finding data on the original question and I was wondering if I could change my paper to Investment in Knowledge, comparing some European countries with the United States and then with others throughout the world, including the OECD average. I found lots of data by way of graphs, etc. Where did you get the data from? From various sources, books and journals. Mm -hmm. How are you going to present the material? I am going to use the electronic whiteboard as suggested and do a blend of graphs, pictures, text and podcasts to illustrate my presentation. It sounds very impressive. Yes, let's hope the whiteboard works. But I'm also going to have a PowerPoint presentation for a backup, just to cover myself. A backup is a good idea, but it's a lot of work doing everything twice. It is, but at least I'll have experience of both. Before we talk about how to use the data I've selected, 
Could you give me the names of a few websites I should look at for more specific background material? When you type in anything to do with knowledge, there are millions of sites listed. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 30. Let's see. Oh, I'll print you off this list. Oh, there we go. Right. Do I really need to study everything on these? No. I suggest there are five or six you can look at. The one you have to go through is the IT department section on the university site, which is www.kmul.org. It has articles by all of us in the department and has links to useful information, so I think it is essential to look at this. OK, I've already been on it, but I'll take that one as a must-read. And there's a site which is hosted by Pollock. It's investmentit.com. All you need to do is to skim the abstracts of the articles on the site. They'll give you a general idea about the effects of investment in knowledge. Yes, that sounds good. It cuts out having to read everything. What about this one, knowledgejournal.com? If I remember, it's not that useful. I would say that there are very few things that you need to read there. Then there's itknowledgereview.com. It's got loads of articles, but it's probably best just to read those that have come out in the last term or so. Do you have to subscribe? No, it's free from the university library. And another free journal online is itonline.com. I wouldn't say it's essential to read it, but it is beneficial. And so I think it is worth a look. If you think it's useful, there is no harm in looking at it. But nationalstatistics.com is worth looking at and trying out the links that it gives. I think these are probably enough to be getting on with. I think so. There's another thing I want to ask about. How much material should I use in my presentation? Avoid crowding the screen. If you have lots of information at one time, people will not be able to follow it. And we'll just switch off. That's worth remembering. I've been in lectures where there was too much detail on the screen and it was impossible to read quickly. But what about visuals? Do you think it's OK to mix visuals and text? Visuals are very useful, but they must be relevant or else people will get confused about what they mean and why they are there and they won't pay attention to what you are saying. So be careful. <laughs> From what I can see, you have the makings of a very good presentation. Thank you. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now, turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk on the work of a printing department at a university. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I am here to give you a brief outline of the work of this new department. The Department of the Printed Word has a very short history, having been created just ten years ago. Some statistics to start with. The first intake of undergraduate students consisted of 20 students, which rose to 37 in the second year, and we now have about 50 in the first year, doing a wide range of courses full and part-time. We have a thriving research department, with 17 students on the taught MA course and 7 students doing research full-time. In all, we have nine full-time lecturers and 16 part-time lecturers who work mainly but not exclusively in our evening department. Of the total student body, approximately 21% are from outside the country, a number which has been increasing steadily over recent years. Although students from overseas have to reach a minimum level of competence in English before they follow a course at the university, some may require remedial help with their English, and we can offer help through the student support services as part of the general assistance given to all students. For home students, both graduate and undergraduate, there are bursaries to help with travel and accommodation for which I would advise you to contact Mrs. Riley at the end of this session. Increasingly, we are forging external links with organisations in the publishing world, and we have been very fortunate in that we have received money to sponsor not just various students within the department, but also technicians and lecturers. Each year we hold a series of lectures which are given by external speakers in the world of printing and the media. The series of workshops that you see around you have been built thanks to a very generous donation which has allowed us to develop our facilities for bookbinding and restoration. Now, the main work of the department relates to teaching the mechanism of printing. And as most printing is now so highly technological, all our students have to be computer literate. For those of you who are interested in taking a module in this department from another department, and who feel that you may not have the necessary computer skills, don't let the technology put you off. We have a number of specialist technicians who can support and deliver crash programs in the computing technology required. As long as you can switch on the computer, you are halfway there. We have what can only be called state-of-the-art facilities especially for those wishing to move into the publishing world, working not just as printers, but also in editing, page design, layout and bookbinding. With the extensive facilities we have for book restoration, some of our former students are now employed as expert book restorers and conservationists, skills which were once almost dying out. In the display you will notice samples of work on book cover design, and, as well as having all the necessary computer programs for dealing with printing, we have some old printing presses. Despite being largely a modern department, we do have an increasing interest in research into the history of the printed word, ranging from early European to Chinese and Japanese printing techniques. We have, in fact, some very well-known experts on early printing in Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries. If this area appeals to you, you can talk to Dr. Fred Clare afterwards. From China, we're lucky to have as a visiting lecturer Dr. Yu, who is an authority on early Chinese manuscripts and printing machines. If you are thinking about doing a module with us, or you are interested in doing research after you have finished your first degree, the person to talk to is Professor Clarkson, who will be able to give you all the details. For postgraduate research, you should really be thinking about applying now, even though we are only in December, as the department now attracts large numbers of people and we always have many applications for each research position. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute...